In the world of modern literature, fantasy is almost inescapable. The genre rakes in over $500 million in sales every year in the US alone, and its trademark dragons, swords, and sorcery can be found in video games, books, movies, television, music, and much, much more. It's become a fundamental part of our modern pop culture, but to me that begs the question, how did we get here? Because fantasy, as its own separate and established genre, has only existed in name for the last 150 years or so, and yet, in less than a century, it's developed its own subgenres, its own literary classics, and plenty of academics tearing it to pieces. This is made possible because the fantasy genre, although only recently realized in its modern form, has been under works for centuries. I would argue since the beginning of human history. It is an amalgamation, a culmination of lifetimes of history, myth, and storytelling, and by tracing its origins, we're able to gain a much better understanding of this beloved genre. In this video, I endeavor to investigate the roots of the modern fantasy genre, beginning in the earliest forms of the storytelling craft and going up to the 20th century when authors like J.R.R. Tolkien began to define fantasy as its own separate art. This video is going to primarily focus on the Western fantasy storytelling tradition, as I simply can't cover the entire world in one video, but the rest of the world has a very, very rich fantasy storytelling tradition, and I hope to cover those in other videos soon. It's important to note that this idea of separate genres, much less a fully separate fantasy genre is a relatively contemporary invention. And that means that most of the historic works that we're going to be looking at today would not have been regarded as fantasy by the audiences that were enjoying them at the time of their writing. However, we can look back at these retrospectively from our position today and see how they contributed to the modern fantasy genre. With that in mind, we begin at the beginning because story has always been a fundamental part of human culture. Long before we were publishing New York Times bestsellers, humans used stories passed from person to person in order to form community. They found these stories very useful for communicating all sorts of ideas, telling the story of the day's hunt, giving someone directions to a watering hole, communicating to one generation the history of the generation before them. But it's only natural, I think, that these stories would often cross over into the realm of unreality. Because as much as these stories were capable of communicating fairly pedestrian ideas, they were also very useful for explaining the unexplainable natural phenomenon like the weather or the origins of the human species. In these earliest days, myth history and religion blended together under this much larger umbrella of storytelling. As a means of communication, it was also a means of survival, and storytelling was as fundamental to the development of early human society as walking. Of course, most of this is conjecture, as we only have hints of this early storytelling tradition left over to us, clinging to the walls of caves, but the earliest written record of storytelling comes 4,000 years ago from the Epic of Gilgamesh. The Epic of Gilgamesh is regarded as the oldest written story ever to be discovered. The poem was first penned in ancient Mesopotamia, and it tells the story of the king of Uruk, Gilgamesh. And even this earliest story contains hints of the fantastic, as we see elements of myth and religion brought in, the hero battling against gods, monsters, and the magic of the ancient world. At the time of its transcription, the Epic of Gilgamesh was likely enjoyed as entertainment, but it was also likely considered an important way to communicate ideals. Gilgamesh's story tells us of friendship, heroism, and religion, acting as a teaching tool, propaganda, and a historical historic record all in one. Ancient works continue to demonstrate the power of storytelling, especially in the Greek epics, which were written almost 3,000 years ago. Homer's Iliad and Odyssey are spun out of an enticing combination of myth, history, and story, and although they are presented as truthful, the presence of gods, monsters, and magic does imply that they may not be an entirely factual record of history. Instead, these stories use the intervention of fantastical elements in order to emphasize the points that they're trying to make. When Odysseus is brought face to face to the sorceress goddess Circe and her arsenal of magical drugs and seduction, and is warned by the messenger god Hermes not to stray from his path, that is 
in all likelihood, I, I hate to tell you this, probably not factually true. However, it is a very important warning to stay true to your ideals, even in the face of beauty and trickery. To be a true hero, this story indicates, you must be able to avoid temptation and distraction. Ancient Greek poets understood that fantastical elements could be used to communicate these ideals much more effectively than a simple presentation of reality. Now, we could debate pretty much for the rest of time the degree to which the tellers of these tales and their original audiences believed these stories to be completely true. We just will never know unless we have a time machine. They did, of course, believe in the gods in these stories. It was their religion, their pantheon of gods, and godlike figures like Odysseus carried real sway in their society. In all likelihood, they kind of found a happy medium, believing the core tenets and a lot of the events from these stories to be true, but thinking that, you know, sometimes poets would be liable to exaggerate. Either way, from a modern perspective, we do think that these stories are almost entirely untrue. However, that doesn't detract from their impact. These were still important moral tales at the time of their writing, and by understanding why these tales were so important, it gives us a much better understanding of the values and ideals of the society in which they were written. It's a sort of time capsule that allows us to see what culture was like back then. The written record of storytelling continues in the Western world through legendary epics such as Beowulf. We believe that Beowulf was written somewhere around the 10th century, making it at least a thousand years old, and it's our earliest example of Old English storytelling and poetry. That manuscript, which is likely a transcription of a tale that was originally told orally, tells of a hero named Beowulf. He fights against the monster Grendel, defeats Grendel's fearsome mother, becomes king, and slays a dragon. It's a story of truly epic scale, exploring a world that is dark and violent, kept from the verge of collapse by the actions of a few legendary heroes. The gritty, dark pre-Christian Europe that the tale spells out has been an inspiration for a lot of fantasy authors, and in many ways the tale of Beowulf as an idea of a relic of a long-forgotten ancient Europe is at the heart of modern Western fantasy. Other mythic cycles have been found from the 12th and 13th century in Europe, such as the Norse Prose Edda and the Welsh Mabinogion, and these works have allowed us a precious glance into the daily life and beliefs of the time that they were written. These tales, much like the epics that came before them, straddle the line between history and myth, between reality and unreality. And yet we're still able to find truth in them, spelled out in quests, in journeys, in dragons and magic. Believable histories, morals, and faith wrapped in the murky unbelievability of early fantasy. In the later medieval period, the written record began to be fleshed out a little bit better, meaning that we have some works that are meant to be clear presentations of factual reality. Still, there was plenty of room for written fiction, and a treasure trove of this came from the Arthurian tales. Although there was probably an actual historical figure of King Arthur, it's clear that to even medieval audiences, the stories of King Arthur and his round table were just that stories. But that didn't negate their value. The tales of King Arthur and his noble knights of the round table were immensely educational and entertaining. They taught people of chivalric values, showed them lurid romances, and presented to them a world of intrigue and adventure that the average medieval person would never be able to experience. Written into these tales are elements that are distinctly fantastic. Some of these monsters, such as dragons, were thought at the time to actually have existed, in the same way that to a medieval peasant, a lion existed. You know, you had never seen one in real life, but the stories told you it was true. And magic and witchcraft was also thought to be relatively real at the time. But there are some stories, like Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which tells of a a gigantic, gorgeous, entirely green man on horseback who can survive getting his head cut off, and things like that were probably believed in the same way that most people believe in Santa Claus. But these mythic cycles were important. They communicated history, morals, and ideals. They showed what was important to the highest classes of society. They acted as education and propaganda, spreading the world as they wanted to see it across continental Europe. The Renaissance, or the rebirth that occurred in European culture around the 16th century, changed a lot of things, including their methods of storytelling. They adopted a very cynical and critical view of the Middle Ages, including its beliefs, practices, and myths, 
And this meant that the stories they told, while still including some elements of fantasy, didn't have the same engrossing, all-encompassing scale of early medieval epics. The plays of Shakespeare, which were written around this time, exemplify this idea. Many of his stories engage with elements of the fantastic, such as his Fairies at Midsummer or the magical world of the Tempest, but the stories tend to mark these things as obviously unreal. The fairies are something of a midsummer dream. The world of the Tempest doesn't need to be strictly believed for the story to be enjoyed. Queen Mab the fairy is not presented as an actual historical figure, but rather a figment of an overactive imagination. Even creatures which were largely believed in at the time, such as witches, were used by Macbeth, not as a real character, but more so as something used to call into question the reality of the entire play. They are a tool, a representation of the blurred line between reality and superstition, rather than being presented as actual denizens of the earth. As the Renaissance progressed, and as people began to get a better grasp of the world and the way it functioned and its possibilities, they also became aware of the impossible. We begin to see a clear delineation between what is real and what is unreal, what is pedestrian and what is supernatural. And it is because of this that we begin to see what the fantastic is truly capable of in writing. The end of the 18th century saw the rise of Gothic literature, which although very different from fantasy, laid a lot of the groundwork for it. Gothic literature was largely concerned not with presenting the world as it was, but rather as it was felt to be. It grappled with heavy ideas of morality and philosophy, trying to determine right from wrong, and it used florid, rich descriptions of the setting in order to reflect the internal turmoil of its characters. One of the pioneers of this genre was Mary Shelley, best known for her novel Frankenstein. Frankenstein grapples with topics of a creator's responsibility responsibility to the creation, the roles of humankind in the greater cosmos, an intense moral and philosophical deadlock framed by lush descriptions of the Genevan countryside. Across the Atlantic, the author Edgar Allan Poe was also defining the gothic genre. His tales and poems often linger in the hazy line between the real and unreal. The narrator of The Raven is trapped in his bedchamber and his own mind as he tries to digest the loss of his lover Lenore. Oftentimes, Poe's works are led by unreliable narrators for whom the horrific fantastic seems hauntingly real. The fantastic is an ominous possibility, all the more terrifying for the fact that it is happening in your own mind. Gothic literature laid the groundwork for a lot of genres today, including fantasy, but also sci-fi and horror, and it also in that moment inspired a wave of romanticism. That is the movement of romanticism, to be entirely clear, with a capital R. I, I don't think anyone was getting particularly turned on by uh, Edgar Allan Poe and Mary Shelley. Well, Romanticism, a movement that took place in music, art, and literature, was a bit like Gothic literature if it went outside and touched grass. While Gothic literature took a cynical and tortured view of the world, Romanticism looked at the world around it and the people that inhabited it in much more lush, verdant colors. The natural world and the intricacies of the human condition could be seen as moving and aspirational rather than dreadful. This love of humankind and the lands where we came from also sparked off a very nostalgic sort of nationalism. They thought that there was value to be found in studying your own heritage and culture, and stories played a very large part in this. In 1812, the Brothers Grimm published the first of their collections of German folk and fairy stories. They were tales originally intended for an adult audience, a sort of literary archaeology meant to preserve the oral traditions of Germany at the time, a snapshot of their values, worries, and fears. The Brothers Grimm thought that a people's stories were a distillation of their culture, an idea that would only become more popular as time went on. Medievalism also became immensely popular at this time, spearheaded by a group called the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, who first formed in 1840. 
1848. They were a group of English artists that wanted to rebel against the modern tenets of art at that time, reaching back to a largely idealized medieval and renaissance past. Their art and literature was characterized by lush, oversaturated details, oftentimes religious, noble figures, and a rejection of the rapidly industrializing world around them. It was around this time that Beowulf, the prose Edda, and the Mabinogion were rediscovered and translated, and medievalists treated these works like gospel, a treasure trove of knowledge about the lost history of pre-Christian Europe. This renewed fervor for all things medieval also brought the Arthurian tales back into the limelight. They were translated, retold, and rewritten, and when they felt that those original stories had worn out, authors reused the characters, tales, and worlds in order to tell new stories. It was a marvelous sort of early Arthurian fanfiction. Of course, not everybody was on board for this wave of sweet, idealized nostalgia. Realism first popped up in the 1850s in France as a response to romanticism and a culmination of the rapidly changing political landscape. Realism refused to gloss over the ugly, painful parts of the human experience. They wanted to strip away the rose-tinted glasses of romanticism and make art for the everyman, something that would be understood and related to even by the poorest and least fortunate. They resented the sickly sweet presentation of a perfect past Europe and wanted to look into the now, which was rife with turmoil and change. Their art was a far cry from the rich, saturated works of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, and authors like John Steinbeck, George Eliot, and Mark Twain wanted to tell stories that were much more grounded in reality than any epic fantasy ever was. Realism was, in particular, fueled by an idea that modern science had led man to an almost complete understanding of the world around us. We now had seen every continent, seen every species, tied all of it down to maps. We understood the cosmos, we had labeled the stars and the planets, we had picked the physical world around us apart into atoms. When all the world had been spelled out so clearly, how was one to earnestly believe that the shadows could be hiding dragons, witches, or magic? Shouldn't we show the world as it marvelously is rather than what our ancestors supposed it could be? And this may sound like a direct condemnation of modern fantasy, but realism is the necessary counterpoint that allows fantasy to exist in the modern imagination in the way that it does. We cannot have the artistic expression of the impossible until we have a clear idea of the limits of scientific possibility. From this point onward, the fantastic had to clearly differentiate itself. It had to be intentional, it had to be a choice, it could no longer be written off as a simple misunderstanding of reality. At first, the new genre was struggling to get its footing, but one creature managed to survive, lingering even in the rationalized Victorian minds, fairies. They had to be shrunk down from their previous mythic counterparts and made much more trivial if they wanted to slip through those barriers, but artists like Richard Dad cemented this idea of fairies as something small, something that could even hide between leaves or under toadstools. Fairy stories written about these magical creatures and the enchanted worlds that they inhabited gained a lot of popularity in the Victorian era. However, the inherent and explicit unreality of these stories meant that they were written primarily for children, whose young minds were supposed to be more susceptible to the wiles of the Fae. Fairy tales of the time were also often part fable, highly moralized and trying to tell a very obvious lesson. It should make sense then that children would be the audiences for these stories, who still needed to be told that it wasn't wise to walk alone in the woods at night. George MacDonald, in particular, was a master of these children's fairy tale stories. He drew from medieval and renaissance inspirations, and his tales such as Fantasties, The Golden Key, and Lilith used fantasy intentionally as a tool to explore the human condition. MacDonald is largely regarded as the gold standard of this era of fantasy, and he inspired many emerging authors such as C.S. Lewis, but in his own time, he was most influential as the mentor to one Lewis Carroll. Carroll is best known for having written the tale Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, 
a story that has clung stubbornly to public imagination since its publication in 1865. It tells the story of Alice, a little girl who falls down a rabbit hole and finds herself transported to Wonderland. Wonderland is a whimsically nonsensical place where puns and wordplay hold more value than logic and where nursery rhymes come to life. It is also distinctly frightening. Wonderland seems to escape all comprehension, and it is a bafflingly confusing place where every known rule is turned on its head. Through Alice's eyes, we see what it's like for a child trying to navigate the incomprehensible adult world. Although a child, Alice is a very well-written character, deeply relatable even to adult readers. It leaves us wondering if Wonderland might be a bit like the world outside it, a baffling and arbitrary place when you don't understand the rules. Lewis Carroll masterfully wielded fantasy in order to tell a larger story about the truth of the world and our perception of it. Alice in Wonderland and the many children's stories that came out around this time, from Peter Rabbit to the Blue Fairy Book, are the foundation of modern fantasy creating many tropes and cliches that are still recycled in our fiction today. Still, the burgeoning fantasy genre would not be where it is if it had remained firmly chained to children's literature. Luckily, with the help of fervent medievalism, some authors were willing to try and tell a fantastical story even for an adult audience. One such author is the British writer William Morris. Morris crafted works that were undeniably and intentionally fantasy. He had a fondness for the medieval period that bled into much of his works, translating Icelandic sagas and setting most of his works in an idealized medieval-inspired realm. He is credited with pioneering the idea of quest fantasy, a structure that would dominate most of 20th century fantasy, and also introduced the idea of using elevated quasi-medieval dialogue for your stories. Most importantly, for a Tolkien fan at least, he presented this fantastical world as if it were true. Most fantasy leading up to this set the fantastical world to the side. It framed in fantasy, saying that the world of magic was a dream, or that it was a secondary place only accessible by a rabbit hole. It had the fantastic seeping into the real, magic dripping into the fringes of our understood reality. Previous fantasy writers had donned a cloak of belief that the fantastic could occur in our world, or had provided a shell structure to allow the reader to travel. William Morris constructs a world as if it is the only world that exists. And I think it is fascinating that this has become the dominant form of fantasy because it represents a return to form. The ancient epics of Gilgamesh, Odysseus, and Beowulf were, through a modern lens, full fantasy. They presented their mythic world of monsters and magic as if it were the only world that existed, and most modern fantasy authors try to do the same. The journey of the budding fantasy genre represents one of flux. It was once the standard, the reality of the everyday man, but rationality pushed it into the fringes. It made fantasy something only accessible by dreaming, or by transportation to another world, or something that sometimes showed through the gaps of our provable reality. But by the 20th century, we had come back around, creating truly immersive fantasy worlds, willing and able to suspend our disbelief, our rationality, in favor of the deeper truths that we find in fantasy. The reason that the genre has stuck around, the reason that most of our ancient epics could be considered considered to be it, is that fantasy is important. Prehistoric humans telling tales over a fire didn't need to concern themselves with whether the stars in the sky were actually monsters and men. They found it valuable. They found truth in these untrue stories, a sort of magic that infused our society back then and still shapes it today. Neil Gaiman put it beautifully when he said, The Fantastique offers a roadmap a guide to the territory of the imagination, for it is the function of imaginative literature to show us a world we know, but from a different direction. Fantasy, though it has only recently been called such, has always been with us, presenting an alternate understanding to the world as we know it, a different angle from which to tackle our problems, a world to escape into, a magic that we have sought since we first learned to speak and understand.
There is so much more to explore in the stories that I discussed in this video and the ones that I wasn't able to get to, but I want this video to lay the groundwork for a lot more videos to come. Next week, I hope to launch my Foundations of Fantasy series, starting, of course, with The Lord of the Rings. And that's going to be a series that talks about major foundational works and how they shaped the genre as we know it, going up through the 20th century and back. But I would love to hear what your experience has been with the fantasy genre. So in the comments, let me know how you discovered fantasy and what it has come to mean to you. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to give it a like because that really helps things out on my end. And if you want to stay up to date with this series and all the other videos that I make on this channel, consider subscribing and turning on notifications. And if you're interested in supporting me on Patreon, that is linked in the description. My patrons are the ones who make it possible for me to make videos about the things that I love. And for that, I am immensely, immensely grateful. So thank you so much for joining me this week. And I hope that you have a very happy, Hobbity day.